We have Matthew Pose. How you doing, my friend? I'm good. How are you? Not too bad, considering we've changed our clocks, and I'm kind of a little disoriented over that hour change. I keep thinking it's you know an hour later than it really is. It's Welcome been... back, my friends. I'm oh, here. sorry about that. I have Alex. sound going. Okay. So, anyways, guys, um, we're back. We're here with Matthew. We're going to discuss room acoustics. We're going to talk about the difference between studio versus domestic listening spaces and the proper treatments for each environment and also define why the environments are different. And before we really got things going, we go, before we really get things going here, I kind of wanted to just show a few pictures and then Matt, we could kind of talk about this a little bit. So, sure. so this is a mixing studio here, famous one, actually Abbey road, um, you know, where the Beatles are from. Of course they didn't have BMW speakers back then, but, I just think it's interesting to see the acoustical space here that you're looking at. It's sort of like a near field environment, right? Because you're pretty close to the speakers with, in, in relation to the seat and the mixing console. Maybe that's probably referred to as either midfield or far field, to be honest. Um, those mixing, it's probably perspective, but um, the actual console there is much deeper than you probably realize. Um, near field would actually require the speakers be right up on the console. Uh, I got you. So I do have a, an example of that. Not this one. This is a nice kind yeah. of a contemporary with legacy speakers. And that would be far field. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, so where is it? I had one. I guess I, think I, I just saw it. it. I don't know. That one with the Viacoustics. No, you had it right there. That one. Oh, this one. Yeah. So this is kind of more of a near field, right? I mean, it's pretty. It is. Yeah. 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 So there's different goals between. Um, you know, these kind of listening spaces, I think we should talk about. And, and I noticed there's people that say, well, what shouldn't we do what they're doing in the recording studio at home? Because we want to simulate the acoustics and we want to ha actually have the same speakers and try to replicate everything that's happening in the recording studio in the home. When really that's usually not the case. And sometimes it's not compatible with what you're doing in a home environment. So like, for example, this is a home environment. This is uh, some big JTR towers, right? Mm -hmm. Two rows of seats. I mean, you can see that has a lot of absorption on the side walls here. So, yeah, so I wanted to, and this is really nice. I love this star padding. This is something I want to do in the next home theater I build, hopefully. Um, I just think that looks awesome. But let's, uh, let's go back to not sharing screen. So yeah, why don't we talk about this a little bit and why are the goals different between a mixing studio, a production studio, and a home environment? Well, so <clears throat> when you're uh, putting together a studio, there's different spaces within that studio that serve various purposes. There's a live room where uh, the actual performance takes place, the production of music in terms of the singing, the uh, uh, playing of instruments, things like that. And those rooms typically are designed to have acoustics that are favorable for recording the instruments themselves. They usually are adjustable because the kinds of acoustics you want depends on what it is you're recording. Um, and they're usually very large, uh, significantly larger than a, a home domestic living space would be. And so the way in which those are treated is quite a bit different than the way you would treat um, pretty much anything where you're trying to listen to music. Uh, there's another space often seen, the singing booths. Those actually are basically like anechoic chambers. They have no reflections in them. That's in order to get a very clean voice. The stuff that people, I think, think of when they think of studio uh, is uh, what's referred to typically as the mixing room. And in that room, one of the main purposes of that space is to allow the engineer to hear in detail without distraction everything going on in the mix. And so if there's a lot of acoustic, uh, room acoustic interactions going on, even though those may be a part of the, the natural reproduction of music, they can be distracting to the engineer and make it difficult for them to be able to hear into the mix. And so it's become trendy, basically, for the design of studios to get rid of any kind of room interactions. And they do this by creating an area around the engineer um, or engineers where uh, basically there are no reflections. And this minimizes these uh, problems that can be created as a result of that. The, the other side of it, though, is that it also gets rid of any kind of um, reverberation in the room that would be uh, more natural to what you hear. So 
its purpose, as I said, is basically to make the room not distracting. I refer to it as sort of music microscope. But to compare it to what you're trying to achieve in a home, I think misunderstands what we're trying to do in a home. So I would argue that the purpose of a home listening space is the accurate reproduction of music. Uh, I should say the accurate reproduction of the musical event that is recorded there. Whereas the studio is trying to accurately reproduce the details of the music contained within the musical event, but it gets rid of intentionally some of that musical event, which would be the room itself. And so uh, that, you know, to try to conflate the two, I think really can end up leading to a room that doesn't necessarily sound good. Um, and we can talk about this later, but there's actually research to support that notion as well. Yeah, and you know, the other thing I noticed when I spoke to several mixing engineers, some of the famous ones like Elliot Shiner, who did the mm -hmm. Eagles, and he's, he did the first Porcupine Tree um, DVD audio disc back in the day. Um, I, I spoke to him, I met him on a home theater cruise, and he, both himself and several other mixing engineers that I met there, they were still of the mindset that they're mixing for one single sweet spot. So they wanted five full range speakers. They didn't even want a subwoofer. Mm -hmm. And they wanted to have every speaker produce bass and they wanted, you know, everything summed into one point. And I tried to explain to them that in a home theater environment, that's not the case. That's not how most people are setting up the home theaters. And in fact, it's not advantageous to run all bass capable t speakers all around you. You and I, as we preach many times on here, you're better off having multiple sources of bass through distributed subwoofers around the room to get the best modal behavior in your room and then base manage all your other speakers. And we also design a home theater environment to have not maybe not every seat a good seat because that's kind of a lofty goal, especially if you have multiple rows, it's kind of hard to achieve, but at least to have a much wider sweet spot so multiple people can have a similar experience, not just one person. Yeah, and I think one of the things that's important to remember is that even though we often hold up the mixing engineers and music production as the holy grail of sound quality, meaning these guys were the ones who did it, therefore they know what it's supposed to sound like. The other side of this is that not a lot of science has actually gone into the development of studio design. And uh, at times that has been uh, to the serious detriment of studio design with some of them being pretty bad. Um, I would say probably since the 80s, they've improved dramatically, but at the same time, much of the approaches like lead, like non-environment, really were um, engineers who were coming up with solutions to problems in the literature, but the solutions themselves were never tested, not in a scientifically rigorous manner. And so it's really debatable how good those solutions were. And uh, uh, to be honest, there's there's some research suggests some of those solutions are not very good, even though they're in common use. The speakers that were used in studios for a long time were very poor. Um, one of the things that gets pointed out about the live ed, dead ed style room that's used in studios is that it was designed around a particular speaker that had a horrendous frequency response. And a lot of people say, yeah, but they're not used anymore. I see them in studios still. They're very popular. People are into them, even though they're not a good speaker. They shouldn't be used. Not to put you on the spot, but I'm curious, what speaker is it? It's not the old Yamaha NS1000, is it? No, um, you're going to have to give me a second. It's, I'm drawing a blank. You know, it, it's when you get put on the spot, you always forget the name of things. <laughs> it's the one with the little blue. It's a coaxial type uh, with a little blue waveguide in the middle. Is it a Tenoy? No, Harman bought them. Uh, it used oh. to be its own company, but Harman bought the brand and... Basically, they got they were tested uh, as part of Harman's listening test for sound quality, and it was the worst scoring speaker they ever tested. Set wow. a new low, is the way Tool put it in his book. So they went and they bought the company as a result. That was, I think, that's my understanding. Somebody else may know the history better. This is actually oh. before my time, so I may be telling it wrong. But uh, it's the point is this speaker. For those who do understand it, this speaker is known to be a particularly bad speaker. But there's a lot of people who are into them because the lore that was built up around them. They were yeah. a time coincident speaker there. So they were perfectly time aligned. And there was this view that they were the most accurate reproducer and they were great in studios. Yuri, that was the rant. U-R-E-I. Oh, I never heard of them. So uh, the point was they actually were a really bad speaker. They aren't the only bad speaker. There are others out there that aren't great. I mean, even the Yamaha NS10M, which was popular for near field, is not a great speaker. It's an okay speaker, better than Yuri's. But um, the problem is people mix around these errors. So um, 
one of the arguments for lead was it was essentially a solution to a bad speaker, but it wasn't a universal solution, even though it started getting applied later on in that way. And when speakers improved, there was an argument that that design wasn't necessary, but it's continued on and people sometimes still build those. Um, so I think going back to the point though, a lot of these designs came about more, like I said, as a solution to a problem that themselves were never tested. And it's unclear that they actually solved the problem they were supposed to solve. But they do things to the sound that would be uh, counter to how real live performances would exist in a room, basically. So a real live performance, if you were to go uh, to a jazz club or a blues club or a um, sym symphonic hall or something like that, even a, a small rock concert, if, as long as it's inside at least, would have reflections all around you. And the ratio of reflected to direct energy um, would tend to be almost even with direct to, uh, I'm sorry, to reflected to direct energy. And um, the delay on the reflections would be pretty high because usually the spaces are pretty large. And all of those reflections basically, which mix with the direct sound, tell our brain what kind of room we're in. So they help us to kind of understand that we're in a real live space. And obviously they're coming from all around us with a lot of those reflections coming from behind us in what's known as a reverberant field. In our small rooms that we listen in, we have reflections too. But when we put together a two channel system, there's a couple of issues. One is those reflections are much shorter than they would be in a normal live performance space. And the other is that only two speakers are actually reproducing any sound. So the reflections are basically co coming from those speakers interacting with your room. In these studio designs, they're getting rid of most of those reflections. And as a result of that, you really don't have those cues. So like in a non-environment room, they're actually intentionally trying to design basically an anechoic space to listen. So there's no reflections in those rooms at all. So real quick to interrupt you on that point, someone asked this question, which I thought would be good to answer. Wouldn't it be better if a sound engineer used headphones instead of treating a room? So if, if you're getting rid of the room, why not just put headphones on and that's you're accomplishing the same thing? Well, there's a lot of engineers who do that. I actually worked on a project with somebody. Um, he was the head of the project and I was just um, uh, one of the acoustic engineers for it. But uh, it, it was a relatively well-known studio in Chicago that had gone into disrepair. And as a result of that, the engineers were doing all of their, the mixing engineers were doing all of their mixing on headphones. And it was finally decided that they wanted to repair the studio so that the engineers could stop using headphones. So my, I'm not, you guys gotta know, I know acoustics, I don't know mixing. But my understanding was that the feeling was that that was not an accurate way to mix uh, everything. Um, now the engineers were telling me that even though there were deficiencies using headphones, they adapted. They just, they knew in their head Whatever they heard on the headphones, um, uh, they could fix in the mix to sound right on speakers. But you know, a couple of things that would make sense to me based on my knowledge of acoustics would be that the headphones would not as accurately reproduce the sound stage. It's very in your head, and um, so it may not reproduce well on speakers. Um, so it's possible that they were making errors in that regard. The other thing is that a lot of headphones, the bass is not quite the same as it would be on normal speakers. You don't so get the same visceral impact, the low frequency impact in a headphone that you could out of a tower speaker. Yeah, basically. and the responses are not always great on headphones in the low frequency. Some of them roll off quite a bit sooner than, <clears throat> sorry, than you would realize. So the point is, I think that there were errors basically with trying to mix on headphones exclusively and they wanted to make sure they had speakers as well. I mean, a lot of the engineers I've talked to in the past have basically told me that they try to create within their mixing rooms, especially in the mastering rooms, an environment that can recreate everything that they know the end user will use the music on. So they, I don't know if you've ever seen these, there's these little cube speakers, they're small, they have little cheap full range drivers and they're, they sound bad. Their sole purpose is actually to mimic what a little like Bluetooth speaker or cheap car stereo speakers would sound like. So when they mix on them, they know, in their words, it still sounds good on those. I mean, it doesn't sound good on those. I think they're really trying to make sure it doesn't like overload them or anything. Yeah, I got you. So before I interrupted you with that question, you were talking about the difference between the direct uh, sound versus reflected sound in a um, live event versus a two channel room, for example. Uh, one point I wanted to also mention is the speaker environment is different too, because when you're in a concert environment, you're using a different kind of speaker. You're using a line array speaker, which tends to have uh, a longer far field 
than a typical speaker that's in your room. So you, you know, that the, the um, sound drops off at three dB per doubling of a distance instead of six dB per doubling of distance. Uh, otherwise, if you try to put a normal conventional three or four way speaker in a big concert venue, it's just not going to project the sound out far enough. So there are differences not only in the acoustics of that space, but also the way the speaker is projecting the sound. Uh, <clears throat> sure, yeah, that's that's certainly true. The, the amplified systems that are used in live events are quite a bit different from what you'd use in a home or a studio. And again, I wouldn't try to recreate what's happening in a live event in terms of like how they amplify music in a home. It doesn't make sense. You're 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 working on very different scales here. Um, but you know, going back to the studio piece, so we typically listen on two speakers, which is loaded with problems. In fact, you and I should do a video one of these days on why two speakers does not accurately reproduce a real musical event compared to a surround system. Um, but it, you know, the, the whole point in studios, the why they were treating these was, especially the early reflections, was because it causes something known as comb filtering. So when you've got these like sidewall reflections, for instance, they mix in within what's known as the integration zone. It's an area within the first 30 milliseconds where our brain doesn't tend to discern the direct initial sound and the reflections as necessarily being separate. It hears them as essentially the same signal, but it smears it. And when you take a measurement with like an omnidirectional microphone in a room, like a measurement microphone, you see these little ups and downs in a repeating pattern in the response, often in the mid and high frequencies. They exist in the bass too, but they're wider apart, so it's not always as obvious. And so um, engineers were seeing this. There was research that was showing that when you added in intentionally comb filtering to music, and especially in isolation over headphones, it was very audible. And so the thought was, well, if it's so audible on headphones in these you know, test situations, it must be detrimental to mixes. It looks bad, so we should get rid of it. And it, you know, it's distracting. And so that's where a lot of those, especially like the non-environment room type approach lead, which it would essentially absorbs all the early reflections and some of the hybrid approaches that have erupted since then. We're really focused on getting rid of those. But what happened was when they started to actually do research on what people found to be a more accurate reproduction of sound, and they blinded them to the listening conditions they were in, what they found was most people, including mixing engineers, preferred reflective environments, especially when the music uh, was initially in a live, uh, a large uh, acoustic space. So uh, symphonic music sounded best in a reflective environment. Studio recordings, which themselves are often already pretty dry, some people preferred the sound in a, um, not as reflective environment that more match the original studio. And to use Floyd Tool's, you know, circle of confusion idea, it's totally possible that the reason for that preference is because that's how it's being mixed in the first place. And so that is a better approximation of how it was originally intended. We don't know. I mean, it's, that's the whole point of circle of confusion is we don't know what was intended originally, what the system was they were using, or the best way to reproduce it. But that's what the research was showing. But by and large, even mixing engineers were fixing Fix, uh, picking reflective environments as the preference. There was even a study done at McGill University that found that when they blinded a bunch of mixing engineers to the kind of mixing environment they were using, the reflective environment was the most commonly chosen one as their preferred mixing environment. But what they found was they mixed the mixes equally well in all of the environments, meaning they could adapt. And that's an important thing to remember. When it came back to this comb filtering problem, what we found is that the brain tends to adapt to those errors and you don't notice them. But the loss of reflections in the room, you do notice. And it tends to take away from that sense of spaciousness. The recording loses that live realness to it, basically. I guess what I'd like to know is what do you consider a reflective room? Uh, well, like what's, what's the threshold? Uh, on well, so I would say that, you know, we have to then probably start to use a metric like RT60. And so I would say a reflective room is probably those rooms that are at about 0.35 seconds and above. Now, I, I got to be clear here because we've got an audience that may have more of an understanding than others on this topic and may uh, argue this point. I'm giving you a number that's based on the average size domestic room for what's a reflective space. The reality is that number has to be calculated based on its volume. So 0.35 seconds in a symphonic hall would be practically anechoic 
but 0.35 seconds in a small domestic living room would be kind of the middle point between what we might call a dry, low reflection room and a more reflective space. I would say 0.5 to 0.6 seconds in a normal domestic space would be pretty reflective. That would be to the point where you'd have audible reverberation in the room. Floyd Toole mentions in, I think an article he wrote for you and maybe a, I think it's in his book as well, that he uh, previously in, in Canada had had a listening space that he really liked for classical music using uh, an omnidirectional speaker and it had, I believe it was about a 0.5 second RT60 time, which was intentional for him to better, more accurately recreate that. And I'll just say my own experience is the same, that those more reflective environments tend to better recreate things like large symphonic performances. Um, I would say that drier rooms, the, the ones that are more like what you have in a recording studio tend to fall somewhere between around 0.15 and that 0.35 kind of middle threshold with 0.25 or so being you know, pretty typical. My theater is 0.25, for instance. Um, and even though we're mostly talking about two channel, I'll just mention typically uh, you would want a surround system to be on the lower end of that scale because the surround speakers are reproducing the reverb, so the room doesn't need to add as much. I got you. So, you know, one thing I did notice when I compare uh, normal rooms that are not acoust acoustically treated versus a room that's pretty heavily treated, is you can hear more imperfections in a speaker in a very controlled listening space. Like if there's a lobing problem, if a speaker has multiple tweeters, I could put that speaker in a lively room <clears throat> and pan my head back and forth and not hear the comf or the acoustical interference between the drivers. But then I stick that into a room that's more acoustically controlled and there's a lot lower reverb time. And you mm -hmm. can start hearing frequency aberrations when you stand up and down or go back and forth. So is it because the livelier room is kind of filling in the gaps and you're hearing the reflections that are kind of just blending it all together and you just don't get as much resolution? Are you losing resolution and at the same time you're gaining maybe a fake sense of spaciousness? I don't, a couple of things. So one is I would say reflections are not fake spaciousness. It's real spaciousness. It's just fake in the sense that you're not actually in the real acoustic environment of the recording. Um, fake would be like a DSP trick. Basically. Yeah, yeah, it's bad choice. Bad choice of words in the in the I, era of DSP. <laughs> I, I just know some people are probably going to latch on to everything we're talking about here, and I want to make sure they understand that those reflections are actually how you create spaciousness. That's why we would encourage keeping some of them at least. Uh, in terms of what you're talking about, yes, actually, reflections do fill in imperfections, including the crosstalk cancellation that takes place when two speakers are working uh, to produce a, a phantom center image. There typically is a, a fairly sizable, like as much as 10 decibel dip at two kilohertz. So um, having all those reflections fills that in. When there's errors in the response, like you're mentioning off axis, then same thing. You start to see some of that get filled in by the reflections in the room. On the other hand, if the room is absorbing a lot of those reflections, then they're gonna those imperfections in the response are gonna be more noticeable. That's also why, when the other side of this is that, for instance, when the ITU de developed a standard for rooms to use to uh, be able to to essentially pick apart music or equipment and detect flaws in it that room was designed not to be like the best listening room. It might be, it probably is a very good listening room. I've actually built some to that standard before, but um, it's, uh, but it, that was not its purpose. Its purpose was to be that sort of musical microscope. So it gets rid of reflections that would otherwise distract you from those imperfections um, so that you can hear them. Whether that's desirable or not depends what you're trying to do. Obviously, if you're doing research uh, and you're trying to intentionally pick up our problems, then yes, that's a room you would want. In your home, I think it just depends on your goals. Understood. So you said something that was I, that, that I think is pretty important, but we kind of glossed over before. If you're comparing two-channel to multi-channel, the goals of the acoustic space change. You actually need essentially more treatment in a room with more speakers. Is that what you were saying? Because the, the extra yeah. speakers are creating the acoustical uh, landscape for you already. Exactly. And so you don't need the room to contribute as much. So there are people who give hard numbers. They say like a theater has to be 0.2 seconds, for instance, and a, a two channel room has to be, let's say, 0.4 seconds or whatever. The, again, the problem is that that number, that right number, is a range, not a single number, and it's calculated based on the volume of the room. Mm 
um, which maybe in the future we can show people how you do that calculation. It's, it's not too hard to do, but the point is the ranges I'm giving people put you in the ballpark because most domestic spaces fall within a particular range. They're all small acoustically and it allows for fairly similar and consistent RT60s. But basically the bigger your room is, the higher the reverberation time can be and still sound, let's say dry, you know, to have low reflections. But surround systems need to be on the dry side for its volume um, because the surround speakers are reproducing that. Now here's the problem. When you make a room really dry because it's a surround system and you want to listen to two channel, now you don't have any of that, those reflections in the room that are needed to give it that sort of spacious sound. And so you have only one option to bring it back and that's to use an up mixer, a surround up mixer. And I don't know about, about Eugene, but you know, my experience in the past is that they can be very hit or miss. Some of them are great. Some of them are not. And I also find some of the great ones are great with some music and not with others. So I find myself at least turning it on an awful lot. Well, I think uh, it gets better if you, for example, if you use the DSU, the Dolby Up Mixer, mm -hmm. if you turn the center spread feature to on, so that way it's not dumping all that info into the center channel and it actually uses the center channel a lot less. So you're still getting yeah. the phantom center. You're getting the phantom center from the front speakers with a little supplementation from the center channel. But if you if you turn on the DSU and you put on center spread, and in some processes you can actually lower the surround levels, you could shift the balance more towards the front of the room instead of the rear of the room. I think it works better for more music than it does less at this point. I mean, back in the day when we only had Dolby Pro Logic or Dolby Pro Logic 2, yeah, I would say the up mix up mixes were hit or miss for two channel music. But I think we're at the point now with the DSU that it's I don't, there's very few instances where I prefer just straight up two channel anymore because I have yeah. my system really well balanced for using the DSU. Well, and I, I will say, um, I, I've heard people disagree with me on this and I'll just say to each your own, for me, it's much easier, either I'm much pickier or it's easier for me to pick apart flaws with music than movies. Yeah. And so I find with movies that it's not that hard to get a system that sounds really good to me where I feel like the surround speakers are um, meshing well with the front speakers, that there's a good balance and the effects seem to surround me in a way that it's it's not necessarily discernible as like good front speakers and some, you know, cheap surround speakers. Everything seems to go together. With music, it feels like it's really difficult and important to ensure that the mix is right, that the surround speakers are totally matched to the front. You know, they have to be the same speaker, but they have to sound similar. Otherwise, I find that the mixes seem to be disconnected as it starts to move to the back of the room. So, um, and, and this goes back to the acoustics issue. I think that if the acoustics in the room haven't been well handled with surround systems, the surround speakers themselves become more distracting and more noticeable because of the added reflections that are created by having those operating as well. Yeah, there's definitely something to that, especially now in the advent of Atmos, because now you're asking people to basically have six to eight speakers relatively close to the listening space because you have the side back channels and the and the top height channels that's a lot of speakers firing at you from relatively four or five feet apart from each speaker so if you've got a lot of reflections in there i've done experiments where i've used test tones pink noise and there are times where i can't tell if the speaker is on the side of me behind me or up the ceiling just using those test tones when i'm sitting in the front row because if all those speakers are so close together and the room is not acoustically uh, well controlled, you can't tell, you can't perceive the direction, the true direction of that speaker. Yeah. So it, it, I think the, the lesson here for everybody then is that with surround systems, often you do need to do more treatment. I would still stand by something I had said in a previous video that I think is important, which is that that doesn't necessarily mean you have to treat the first reflection points. What it means is that you have to reduce the overall reverberation time of the room and those are two different things so so i'm wondering if you want to have your cake and eat it too and you want to have a good two channel environment and you want to have a good surround environment why wouldn't we recommend that you put more absorption in this the seated area around you and behind you and then leave behind the speakers and the side of the speakers more diffusion that way for two channel it doesn't sound too dead you're still getting your early reflections from your front channels and you're providing enough absorption in the listening area so all those speakers aren't just firing and bleeding all over the place. <laughs> that would be the opposite of lead. Um, 
making the front end more lively. Um, although I guess actually your listening space, so lead makes the area dead around the listener, and that's what you're saying. Yeah, um, that would be that concept basically. And I actually think that the principle of that concept has merit, which is why a lot of the what are referred to as hybrid studio approaches maintained that concept of trying to have the area around the listener have less reflections, but the area, other parts of the room be more diffused to create reverberation. So I think the simple answer to you is that that's right. The difference is that where you sit in a room relative to how you'd set up a studio is pretty different. So where you would place treatments also differs. Um, but yeah, I mean, you can put diffusion at the first reflection points, for instance, you can put diffusion um, on the in the back of the room. There's some debate about how that works with surround speakers. And this is going to be another one of those, though. It's all conjecture. There's no research. Yeah. Nobody studied this stuff. But there's some concern that putting diffusion around the surround speakers can actually lead to um, essentially a, a, a like an inaccurate uh, reverberant field around you. No, I was suggesting absorption by the surround speakers and more diffusion oh. uh, by the front speakers. <clears throat> yeah, you can definitely do that. And those are potentially good spots. I mean, I use diffusion on the ceiling. Um, one of my mentors in this industry, Earl Geddes, has, has often uh, been a big proponent of using diffusion on the ceiling. Um, I like diffusion on the front wall behind the, the front speakers. I think that's a good location for it. There's a, a one of the first reflection points there that happens from the speaker uh, kind of going back, if you will. Like it's the sort of the natural radiation pattern of the speaker causes some sound to go towards behind it towards the front wall, bounce that back and towards you. Putting diffusion there then helps to break that up essentially and create more of a diffuse field for that reflection. It's a, it's usually a very strong reflection too when you look at the uh, energy time curve of a room. Um, you can put it at the first reflection points as well in a room. What I would say for people who want to get into this kind of stuff is, because diffusion is tricky, A, it's expensive. I mean, just diffusers cost a lot more than absorbers, typically four or five times more. And you need a lot of them to kind of get these effects. The other issue, though, the bigger one is that I see people misuse them a lot. Diffusers, when you sit too close to them, tend to create what I would describe as a phasey effect. Very similar to, um, for instance, if you wired your front speakers out of phase and you played something, you, you know, it's like it sounds like it's coming from sort of outside your head, but you can't really pinpoint where it's coming from. Well, it causes the reflections to do that, too, when you're too close to them. And so you get this sort of, it's almost like a weird sort of acoustic hole at the side of your head where you're sitting too close to this diffuser where you can tell there's sound coming from somewhere over here, but you can't really place it. And it tends to be distracting. It's a similar thing would be if you were sitting right next to an absorber on one side um, in a reflective space on the other, that one side sounds like it's disappearing and it's distracting because it's right. so different. That that sort of phasey effect caused by the diffuser is distracting because it's so different from the other sound you're hearing. So and that could be that could be a problem for uh, if you look at a lot of how a lot of homes of how people set up their home theaters. I would say eighty percent of the time I walk into someone's home theater, they have their second row or just their primary couch, literally within a couple of feet or right up against the back wall, mm -hmm. and that's a huge, um, a huge mistake to make because now you're you're first of all you're too close to the surround speakers, the back channels. You're at a maximum um, pressure area, so the standing mm -hmm. waves are at their maximum, so you're going to get very boomy bass. And then if you put any diffusion in that area, like you said, you're going to get that phasey effect because you're sitting too close to it. Right, and that's an area where you can put absorption because it would be symmetric to the left and right. But um, it's not to the front and back, but that's fine. But yeah, it's not a good space. I mean, ideally, you don't want to do that. Um, I see people do that a lot, and I've, I've seen some people do it where they put a screen that's way too big in the room and then they push their seat back. And it's like, mm -hmm. if you just put a smaller screen in the room and push yourself forward, you'd actually have a much better surround experience. Yeah, I, I always say, you know, as a rule of thumb, if you're in a room, you wanna keep your seats at least a quarter of, of the length of the room away from that back wall. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just a general guideline. If you could get at least four or five feet, maybe a little bit more than that from that back wall, you're doing yourself a favor. And don't sit on a side wall. I see people putting L couches, you know, a couch that goes like this and like this, and there's people sitting on the left wall. Now you're too close to one surround speaker. You can't possibly have good channel calibration there. And you're you're away from the center channel. So if you don't have if you don't have a center channel that's designed with good off axis response and you have a typical MTM, 20 to 30 degrees off axis from that center channel, you're gonna get massive lobing effect and you're not gonna hear the dialogue intelligibility as well as somebody that's sitting at the acoustical center of the room.
Yeah, it's true. I mean, I, I, I think that the response we'll get from our listeners today is probably going to be, well, you got to deal with the space you have. And I get it. What I would say is, you know, it's okay to have these extra st- seats. You just have to recognize that they're not going to sound good, but you need to make sure there's at least one good seat. Mm. And, uh, and I think when you put the couch against the back wall, you don't have any good seats. That's you know, where that's, you put your mother-in-law. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Um, so yeah, it just, I think the goal should always be make sure you've got at least one good seat and it's got to be pushed out into the room. And I argue guys at least have two good seats because if you have a significant other, you want to put her in a good seat as well. And women have <laughs> women that are into music have very, they have a very, uh, sensitive hearing They they can hear stuff. And I'm not saying this to be sexist, but statistically speaking, women have better high frequency hearing than men. So I sometimes bring my wife into the room to let her hear things that I probably can't hear because I can't hear above 15 kilohertz anymore, but she can still hear to 20 K. So make sure it sounds good to your wife. (laughs) See now that's if your wife cares about this stuff, my wife on the other hand could care less about any of this. She just thinks I'm a crazy person. Yeah. Yeah. I know there's people that get it and there's people that don't get it. It's like that with any hobby. Yeah. So is there any other topic you wanted to bring up about the whole subject about studio recording or studio acoustics versus home acoustics? Yeah, there is. So, I I mean, I think we're trying to make the point that the goals there are a bit different. I think the other part of it, too, is studios are trying to create a standard room in which to mix in. And your home is your home. You know, it doesn't need to be a standard room that's comparable to these others. So ultimately, they're trying to create something that works for them as a tool for mixing. You're trying to create something that makes you happy. That's really the goal of our space. This is a, entertainment. And so I see a lot of people who get into this right or wrong approach. And I don't like that because I think it takes away from the notion that we've put all this time, energy, and money into it in order to provide enjoyment for ourselves. So what I really would tell people is that they should explore these ideas, um, putting treatments in certain places in the room, um, absorbing first reflections, not absorbing first reflections, diffusing, and they should decide what sounds good for them. Because the the first thing that you need to know is that there is some research in this. There is not very much, and no research has provided a single right answer. It is it is simply told us that different people have different ideas of what sounds good. Um, you know, if you want to know what's technically closest to the real live musical event, then a more lively room with more reflections would be technically closer to that. But if you don't like that, then that's it's your room and your equipment. Well, and I'll, and I'll bring up another point that we should probably do a separate video on. I do think part of the reason why people have different preferences towards having a room reflective or not reflective also has to do with their hearing acuity, uh, their hearing capability. So Mm -hmm. as you get older and your hearing becomes diminished, you have a harder time discerning, you know, reflections, or you have a harder time discerning like noisy events. So when you're young, you could go to a party, you could hear someone talking right next to you, even though there's a lot of loudness around you. And as you get older, it just kind of all bleeds together and you get disoriented. So I would argue that there's probably a case for people that have diminished hearing that would prefer a more dead room because they're going to be able to hear the detail better in the sound, even though it's a more dead room, they can boost the highs and the the reflections won't confuse them as much. There's actually research to support that. So as your hearing becomes... Um, uh, less good, basically, you become less capable of uh, blocking out other sounds, basically. So your brain becomes less able to deal with all these reflections and recognizing what it is supposed to pay to uh, what is supposed to pay attention to the selective attention ability. And not it's that that cocktail party effect that we sometimes refer to Mm -hmm. to start to fail. And so uh, absorbing a lot of those reflections um, can help make the uh, people's voices more intelligible, but it also helps your brain focus more on um, people that are talking to you or in the case of a listening room, the music or the movie. So definitely as your hearing goes, as you get older, having a room that's less reflective is beneficial in that regard. And, and yeah. in this case, it's not about being more accurate to the real event. It's about being more comfortable and more enjoyable. So one last question I have for you, is this a myth or is there truth to it? Does there come a point where if you put a loud, a really big sound system in a room, does there come a point where when you're putting so much SPL in a room that you may have to acoustically treat that room even more because you could overload that room with sound? Okay. Uh I've actually never heard that myth before. I hear people people say that too much. Like often is your speakers are too big for the room 
So you're going to overload the room with sound. So you need to put more absorption or you put, you need to put, you know, you need to tame the room more because you got so much more loudness coming out of these speakers. I would it's, say at that point, if you're, you're just going to blow your ears out anyway, so it doesn't yeah, matter. Yeah, it's mostly myth. So I'll say this, depending on the design of the speakers, there can be a minimum distance for the speaker to act as a point source. And so if the speaker is too large for the space, it won't sound good. But most speakers, even pretty big ones, the point source point, if you will. Yeah, within six is, to eight feet. Uh, easily. And so it ends up making it so that that's not a major concern. There is, this is not a too much SPL for the room so much. It's, it's totally a room acoustics problem. Bookshelves could cause this problem if they had enough bass, but rooms that are very, very tight. And I've mentioned before the type of room that best equates to this typically are in basements when people do like, especially soundproof theaters in a basement can build up a lot of bass. You're talking but, about infinitely stiff walls, basically. Yeah. So as soon as you start to have rooms that have infinitely stiff walls or close to it, especially when there's a lot of mass associated with that stiffness as well, like you would have in a foundation, um, the base builds up because it can't go anywhere. Basically, it can't dissipate. And so what happens is that those hot points in the room where you already have peaks because of the modes are louder yet than they would otherwise be. And it, it creates what I would describe as a sort of low frequency droning effect. Right. And in that particular case, the only the multiple subs won't fix that. All that does, the only thing the multiple subs do is it helps to even it out so that there's not like ringing at particular frequencies necessarily. But what happens is the bass still is decaying over a much longer period of time than it should, which can still not sound good. And so in those types of situations, there's two things you can do. You can turn the bass down. <laughs> Um, but for those of you who don't like doing that, I'm one of those people, you have to absorb it. So in those kinds of rooms, you end up having to add potentially a lot of bass traps to, to deal with that problem. Right. So uh, would uh, decoupling the subwoofers, would that help at all to decouple it from the floors or? No, decoupling the walls helps though. Right. Basically things that you can do to reduce the stiffness of the structure helps. Like I so said, Matt's it's not a speaker problem. Matt, Matt's talking about basically essentially building a room inside of a room where you're putting up metal clamps and you're decoupling the drywall from the foundation, basically. Yeah. You're talking uh, about a very expensive pro proposition there. It is. I did it, <laughs> but yeah. it is very expensive. I spent, I spent more money on my room than my equipment at this point. <laughs> you better never move. Uh, yeah. <laughs> So I think that's, I think that's a good, uh, this is a good stopping point on this topic. Um, I, I know we have about three or four more videos we can make just on stuff we were brainstorming here. So I want to kind of keep this reasonable length because people complain if we go too long. So um, I encourage people to, you know, put some comments down below on, on acoustic topics you'd like to see covered. Let us know how you're treating your room. Um, what inspired your acoustical treatments in your room? Did you do any experiments or did you just go with what other people recommended or what your friends were doing in their rooms? I'm kind of curious to see what you guys did down below. I hope that you guys can share this video. YouTube kind of changed their policy lately. And if you don't give a lot of shares on your videos, their algorithm basically kills the video after a few days. So I really encourage you guys to, after you watch this video, to send it to a friend, send it to a couple of friends, subscribe to our channel if you haven't already. Join our Patreon at patreon.com slash audioholics. You get early access to content that we don't put on YouTube live for several weeks sometimes, even on the editorial side as well. You could also go in there and ask us personal questions we can answer. You could give us some topics you'd like to discuss on video. And Matt, I appreciate you being here on a Sunday night, even with the time zone change and all that stuff going on. I think we had a, a, a fairly productive uh, conversation about the acoustics of studios versus domestic listening spaces. Yeah, I have to point out that James Larson is teasing me right now that I look awful. He keeps putting it in the comments. And so it's worth noting that uh, this is what I do for you guys. Um, I look like I'm gonna die, he says. Um, James and I were out measuring subwoofers today and the temperature range between like 35 degrees and up to 50 degrees at the warmest point. But basically it was cold to be out measuring subwoofers. We were out there for probably eight hours. Uh, and then I came home, 
changed my clothing, ate dinner, and came down here to do the video for you guys. So like, and you're fighting a here. cold at the same and time. And I'm fighting right? a cold. Yeah, I should not have been outside today. I, I warned you, but you are so obsessed with measuring these subwoofers, man. So I can't, I can't hold you back. You got to do what yeah. you got to do, I guess. Well, we wanted to get it done before the season was over. For yeah. those that don't know, measuring subwoofers really has to be done outside to be done accurately. And so for those of us that live, we live in the Chicago area, basically it's seasonal. It has to be warm enough and not wet. So your birth is saying you should come to Florida. So you should come down here and do your measurements. I think you'd be more productive. Yeah. Well, like you, 80 to 90 degrees, no matter what time of year it is. There's probably humidity problems then for the test, but I would love to. And I think I've told you, I've, I've debated moving to Florida before, partly because you can work year round on this stuff. Yeah. Well, I appreciate everything you and James have been doing for us. I think you guys are going to see a lot of surprises coming in the near future. Uh, we've been working on different ways to kind of standardize measurements and sound bars and speakers. And we already have that for subwoofers. So we're trying to expand this out to all categories of speaker products. So you should be seeing some videos and some articles on that shortly. And Matthew, thanks again for battling your cold and battling the cold weather to do all this stuff for us. And yeah. my friends, until next time, keep listening. <laughs>